Hi, a very good morning and warm welcome to our third and final panel session for today, titled Beyond Awareness and Greater Mental Health Support for Youths. My name is Ming Siu and I'm the Executive Director of Campus Sci and will be your moderator for today's session. In recent years, mental health has garnered much traction among youths in Singapore through nationwide anti-stigma campaigns such as Beyond the Label and youth-led grown-up initiatives from the Youth Action Challenge and Youth Mental Wellbeing Network. According to a recent research survey done by the National Youth Council, our youth hope to see a society free of mental health stigma and receive stronger support from institutions such as the schools, the workplaces, as well as online and physical communities. Youth generally felt that there was insufficient access to mental health information, only 39% agreed, and services only 28% agreed. They preferred to seek support from their peers over their family members, teachers, and mental health professionals. Over three in five youths felt that mental health support across various areas of workplaces, community, and schools can be improved. And over one in two youths thought that strengthening of the peer support networks would help the mental well-being of students in schools. So as we move beyond awareness efforts in mental health advocacy, how can the public, private, and community sectors come together to help our youth build better competencies and capacities to support them in their mental well-being. So today we are really honoured to have an esteemed panel of speakers with us today, representing the public, private, community sectors, and not forgetting our youth to weigh in on today's topic. First, we have Ms. Sun Xieling, Minister of State for Social and Family Development and Education, Republic of Singapore. Second, we have uh, Ms. Posh Po, Executive Director of Silver Ribbon Singapore. Third, we have Ms. Colleen Chua, Head Jardin's Ma Mindset. Last but not least, we have Ms. Teslim Abdul Majid, undergraduate, National University of Singapore, and Beyond the Label Ambassador. You can view the few uh, bio of our panelists by scanning the QR code on the website. Before we start our discussion, just a gentle reminder to both our online and in person audience feel free to submit your questions via Pigeonhole, our QA platform, during the discussion. The instructions to access uh, Pigeonhole will be shown on the screen for your reference. To kickstart today's conversation, shall we invite each of our panelists to briefly share with us uh, the work that you're doing in the youth mental health landscape in Singapore and also in your respective sectors. So hi, Mosun, shall we begin with you? I uh, understand that you know, there has been major policy shifts in the uh, youth mental health landscape under MOE and MSF in recent years, and also the setting up of the Interagency Task Force on Mental Health and Wellbeing to coordinate whole of government policies, strategies and partnerships not forgetting the ground-up efforts from the Youth Mental Wellbeing Network. Would you like to share with us uh, what are some of the key focus areas for youth mental health and wellbeing by the government? Thank you for the question, Ming Siu. Uh, the government takes uh, mental wellbeing, mental health issues very seriously. In July 2021, last year, we set up the Interagency Task Force on Mental Health and Wellbeing. And I think in the audience, um, I see many familiar faces or friends who are part of that task force. Um, and even before July 2021, there was a COVID-19 task force on mental health. So it was not that um, we only started looking at issues of mental health because of the pandemic, but rather that the pandemic cast a spotlight because it came into sharper focus, given that uh, there were many stressors um, across society, regardless of uh, age groups be it uh, seniors, working adults or students, uh, children even, I think we're all feeling the stresses and strains that arose from COVID. So I just wanted to say that uh, the coming together to set up this task force was in a way precipitated by that, but it, it didn't, our efforts on mental health didn't just start there. And for instance, I'm looking at my fellow panelist, Posh. She's been at this for more than 15 years. So um, mental health has always been something um, that I think uh, we recognise as a society. Uh, but I would like to touch on the efforts of the Interagency Task Force because the very, by its very nature and name, the fact that it's an interagency task force, um, and who are the main ministries that are involved? MOH, MSF and MOE, and that's why I'm here in this capacity, uh, and also MCCY. Um, and that's because we recognise that it is not just a medical issue. It shouldn't just be, we shouldn't just be considering medicalised solutions. 
I was listening intently to the panelists uh, before this panel. Um, they were talking about the importance of the role of parents and schools. And I kind of felt that my portfolio, MSF and MOE, I was kind of sitting in a hot seat. <laughs> and I felt obliged to respond. Because indeed, by the time we try to address it as a mental health or mental well-being issue, we're really looking already at downstream when actually we should be looking at upstream preventive measures. And that also goes back to what we're looking at um, in the Interagency Task Force on Mental Health and Wellbeing. So for instance, early education, the earliest education starts at home. What are the home environment, what are the factors in the home environment? Are our parents having conversations with our, with our children, the, with the students? Um, when we look at uh, OECD studies, and I've just come back from an international summit on the teaching profession, we found that um, the education and the well-being of the whole child actually is really quite contingent on the relationship the child has, parent-child, teacher-child, peer-to-peer. So we cannot not look at these factors. So one of the things that the MOE is trying to do is that we're trying to help parents. We're trying to help parents to have conversation starters with their children so that they are able to find out more about what their children are thinking. I also heard earlier, I think it was Susan that said that um, children may not open up so naturally, especially about the digital world, to parents, but that does not mean that parents should not upgrade our digital literacy as well as our mental literacy skills. So I think um, parents, unfortunately, parenting is a journey. Parents will always constantly have to upskill their terminologies and also find out um, what their children are doing in the digital world in particular. Uh, another aspect of it is, um, oh sorry, so coming back to, it, to that, so what the MOE is trying to do is that we're working with parents, with parent support groups to see how we can develop toolkits for parents. So I mentioned conversation starters and also encouraging peer support among parents so that they can talk to each other and find out actually how do they better help their children cope with potential peer-to-peer -peer comparisons online, uh, with potential uh, harms they may come across online, or you know just uncertainties and um, in the children's basic, basic growing up journey. The children are exploring, they will have questions, they will find all sorts of information online, and parents have to be there as that trusted adult and significant adult in their lives. Huh? Um, the second part is that Parents may also have certain mental constructs around mental health. When schools or medical, pro uh, when schools uh, perhaps highlight to parents that they may need to watch out for mental health of their children, parents can react in different ways. There can be parents who say, "Oh dear, let me find out what's happening. Let me seek help channels for my child." But there may also be parents who, as, who actually feel that there is a stigma around mental health and actually say, no, 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 there's no issue at all. Let's not talk about this. And by the way, I'm, I may be concerned that this would end up as a black mark on my child's record. So I do not wish to have further intervention. And if that's the case, we are not actually having the interests of the child, the, not having the best interests of the child, and that may be an issue. So one of the uh, interagency task force work is to look at whether this stigma or this mindset that parents have, what are the drivers of it? Is it perception? Or are there actually substantive reasons why parents feel the way that they do? Are there any things around the school system or records, mental health records, or potentially the way employers look at employee selection, whether there are issues around there that perhaps cause concern for parents? So that's another area we're looking at. Huh? Um, and in terms of the community, we need to make sure that uh, there are sufficient layers of support. And it's not the case whereby um, when young people have mental health concerns, that they feel that there is only one help channel, which is the Institute of Mental Health. Uh, I have huge respect for the Institute of Mental Health. But we also do not wish for the Institute of Mental Health to be the only uh, source of help because Mental health and mental well-being is a spectrum. You may be at different points of it. You may be having a, a well-being upstream issue and not necessarily a mental health issue that requires medical interventions or therapy. And if that's the case, and if you're at different points of that 
spectrum. Then what are the different layers of support at the different points that could be best tailored to your needs and your wants. So I think that's another area that the Interagency Task Force is looking at. I think that was a quite lengthy uh, opening remark that I had, so I'll hand it over to you to have the conversation with the other panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mosun. Um, I think you brought up very salient points on parent support groups that MOE is actually embarking on, and also the peer support systems right, uh, that all MOE schools would be having from primary schools all the way until junior colleges. Yes. Right? Um, and I think what you have mentioned also reminded me of what Prof. Daniel mentioned earlier, which is actually strong social support or family support actually helps our youths in terms of their recovery or with their mental health distress and mental health issues. Yeah, so next up, we have Posh. So hi Posh, given the great work that you and your team at Silver Ribbon Singapore has been doing for the community mental health space, uh, would you like to share with us how the youth mental health advocacy efforts uh, and community mental health support services evolve in the social service sector over the past decade? Thank you, Ming Xiu. And actually, I feel very blessed to be seated here in the middle of everyone. And you know, it's like a feast, you know, where everybody talk about mental health. And it wasn't like that more soon, you know, back in uh, 2005 and 2006 when we started Silver Ribbon with the support of, of course, my ex boss, Prof. Swapna, and Prof. Chiang Xiao An, my Tilly sitting. Yeah, all are very beautiful people and they were so supportive when I first started Silver Ribbon. And many people were questioning, Posh, why, why do you want to do that? You know, mental health. You won't be getting funding back then. Back then. <laughs> okay. So the thing is, like, um, everybody uh, now finding me very strange talking about mental health stigma. And, um, yeah, along the way, I just see that, you know, it's a beautiful picture when... Um, we received the support of government and the ministry, all the government agency, and now everybody is talking about collaboration. Collaboration is like, for example, National you know, Council of Social Service on um, Beyond the Labour, and uh, with Pali, you know, Felicia, the good team. Yeah, we work with TikTok as well, you know, on uh, You for Good, and um, it's so beautiful right now. So the thing is, like, we can only make a change when everybody put aside their differences and come together. We can only make a change when everybody acknowledge that this is an issue. Let's address it. And I really appreciate it when during the pandemic, the government actually took very prompt action to acknowledge the issue and what can we do. So you have the national care helpline and everything is, is so good. And of course, like we... Today, I, I see the emphasis on mental health literacy, mental health literacy. So the thing is, like, for Silver Ribbon, we have been like, organizing a lot of conferences with all these beautiful people sharing their knowledge, imparting their skills, and then we have talks, and talks for all stakeholders, because, like, always acknowledge that mental health is everybody's business. So we have talks for religious leaders, we have grassroots leaders, we have um, students, so, um, many people talk about peer support, like uh, uh, Sharon talked about that. And we have been working with NTU and SMU for more than 10 years on uh, peer support and now SUSS. So, it's very important to acknowledge that sometimes there's a need to provide three things. Time. Time for the youth to make a decision. Space. Not that, hey, I see that you're having an issue. Just do something about it. Give them some space to decide and options. You know, I have nothing against Institute of Mental Health. I was formerly from Institute of Mental Health, working closely with all these people. But the thing is, we need to provide more options rather than, you know, now you must seek help from IMH. But where else can I go? And the thing is, like, how about those who are not comfortable uh, to seek help? Or somebody just sharing... I just can't fit in. You mean I need to seek for treatment? So we need to look at that and acknowledge that concern. And another thing is like, is there any way to look at that? Because I have a previous intern named Shalene from Nian Poly. And she, I told her, you know, let's 
like touch on like why people are not seeking for help, why youth are not comfortable to speak to the counselor. So some of the students share that it's because like it's related to disciplinary issue. Wherever I'm late for schools, I'm being referred to a school counselor. Wherever I I'm late in submission of my assignment, I'm being referred to a school counselor. Can we try to look into that? It just the, the whole anger to make it a safe space to build resilience for students to speak comfortably, safely, you know, before they're ready to seek for help. I can never stop, so you better pass it to Colin. <laughs> Thanks so much, Paul. I think yeah. more students wants to address. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was. Uh, sorry, is my mic on? Yeah. yeah. It is interesting you mention it because, um, you know, the Youth Mental Wellbeing Network, um, which was a call to action for ground up action, right? So 1,500 people signed up for it and they organized themselves into organic groups and I distinctly remember there was one group set up who wanted to change the image that counsellors have. So just now I was listening to what Posh was saying. Uh, indeed, um, students sometimes had the impression that when you are sent to see the counsellor, it's because you have done something bad and that everyone sees you walking into the counsellor's room and they wonder what has happened to you. So that in itself is stigmatizing. So you had mentioned the importance of peer support. So that's what we're trying to do. So not that the counselors are not important, but we set up a parallel support structure. But coming back to counselors, how do we change the impression that counselors may have? Yeah? So one suggestion that has come up, and I've seen some schools do it, is that the counseling room is actually a very open concept, like a lounge whereby students go in there, have a Milo, have biscuits, and, you know, and they just go there during recess time, and you don't actually need to make an appointment to see a counsellor. So you take away that image of the counsellor as someone you see when you have a disciplinary issue, or like you're making an appointment to see a professional in that sense. So when you remove that, but it, it, the practices on the ground in schools are not homogeneous. And it is not homogeneous also for good reason, because schools... Sometimes they have different demographics, um, children from different backgrounds. Um, so we, we, we allow a kind of a, de a huge degree of flexibility on the ground, but I'm just offering that as an example. And that I just wanted to offer that also as a possible solution to the question that Posh raised. Over to you. Thanks, you. Thanks so much, Moss. Um, I remembered that presentation uh, um, as part of the Youth Mental Wellbeing Network also. Yes, you remember that. Yeah. So, um, well, back in the times, right, we don't have such counselling services in such a nice counselling area, you know, it's just a room and all. And like what you mentioned, students, they self-stigma and they don't really want to go uh, and seek such services. Yeah, so it, it's a great deal that nowadays schools are doing this to improve the image of counsellors. Yeah, so next up, we have Colleen. Um, Colleen, we know that Mindset and the Jardin Medicine Group uh, have been doing a lot for the corporate mental health space. Would you like to share with us what are some of the key developments on workplace well-being? in the private sector. Sure, thanks Ming Xiu. Morning Moss, morning fellow panelists and everybody in person, virtually. I'm very humbled to be here. I'm Colleen representing Jardine's uh, medicine group of companies as well as Mindset, a registered charity as well as the CSR arm of Jardine's. Um, I think it brings back, your question brings me back to 11 years ago when we were established here in Singapore. So many people came forward to ask us, why does a group company want to do and want to serve the mental health space? I mean, what are you up to? You know, people don't understand the need to talk about it. So we had to explain a lot about us wanting to be here to make a difference, pulling our manpower and financial resource really in the underserved sector then. Um, and I think over the years, that loneliness and battle that we had fought hard um, has seen sort of friction, with, especially with what we say and agree that um, COVID-19 has brought spotlight to mental health. The silver lining perhaps out of covid and um, people now are more willing to share, more willing to talk about mental health. And it also brings back to the workplace where we find ourselves there one third of the time. And perhaps more now when we have the barriers and lines blurred between workplace and home workplace. Right? So I think a lot of corporates like us are returning and thinking about what can we do more? What can we do better for our employees? And then it's really important because it can boil down to... Um, you know, having mental health literacy for our folks and all the way to changing or adjusting our HR policies. So I think personally, I feel that it's important to create the mental health literacy because it really stems from 
you know, as basic things as creating or organizing mental health talks, trainings for your, ex your, your, your employees to maybe conducting power surveys, and even having your senior management talk openly and candidly about the topic, which shows your company's stance and also commitment in this, in this sector, in this topic. Besides that, um, I think it's also important for us to say, look at our HR policies because ultimately that really guides and, and stems what we are doing in the corporate. Uh, I'm, I'm really heartened to hear earlier this morning that Minister Tan said, you know, MOM is looking at how we can pump in more resource to providing hand-holding resource to corporates in terms of inc inclusivity employment for persons in mental health recovery. MySet has been doing that as well. Um, and I think creating the ecosystem in corporates is really, really important. So to have a successful hire, you really have to range to having senior management support, the, the right attitude and guidance from HODs, HRs, and line managers. It could be very important because line managers are the one who could go to your employees and ask you simple things like, how are you today? You know, how often do we have that from our employers or line managers? And I think from corporate, again, we look at sustainability and ESG focus right now, which is a big thing. For us it, at Jardine's Mindset, we have, also been, we have also been forming as well as joining coalitions and alliances, both locally and globally, to see how we can increase or build standards, matrices and guidelines for mental, workplace mental well-being. And I hope to be able to share further success when it comes to friction. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, last but not least, we have Tess Nim, who is joining us uh, online. Uh, and she's currently now in the US and it's actually nighttime there. So hi Tasnim, given the amazing youth mental health advocacy work that you've been doing as a student peer supporter at NUS and uh, as a Beyond the Label ambassador, how do you think that mental health advocacy efforts and well-being support in the schools, particularly in the IHLs, the Institutes of Higher Learning, have evolved? And what can be done more? Thanks, Ming Siu. Good morning everyone. My name is Tasnim Abdul Majid, but I go by Tas on a daily basis. So I'm a third-year psychology student at the National University of Singapore, or NUS. I'm also a peer student supporter with the university. I used to struggle with high anxiety and panic attacks, and now I try to help other young people in similar situations. So in the past year, I've volunteered with nonprofit organizations such as Resilience Collective Beyond the Label and Caregivers Alliance Limited to remove the stigma surrounding mental health conditions. So today I'm representing Beyond the Label as a youth ambassador. So I would say the well-being support in schools have evolved in two ways. So number one, the breadth of support has changed enormously. So I think Ms. Monsoon, uh, Monsoon and soon actually mentioned this earlier. So mental health exists on a spectrum from stage one. We have negative emotions such as anger to stage four when it's full-blown mental illness. So initially the bulk of support, for example, counseling services and therapy was targeted at youths diagnosed with a mental illness. So that is stage four which is only one to 2% of the entire youth population. So many providers of support and youth themselves believe that you needed to be diagnosed with a mental illness to get support, which isn't true at all. So a young person should have access to support at any stage of the mental health spectrum. And that's actually reflected in the support services today. So there's genuine progress. So for example, counseling services in schools are readily available to all students, not just those with a mental health condition. Recently, extensive academic support in IHLs, for example, in my university, so for example, extensions and additional arrangements for examinations, is not only limited to students with a diagnosed disability or mental health condition, but any students who need and would benefit from the support as declared by the university's mental health professionals. And the nature of the support has also changed from top-down support to peer-centric support, as mentioned earlier. As mentioned earlier by you, Ming Siu, a significant proportion of views would prefer to turn to their peers for support as opposed to parents, teachers, and mental health professionals. A lot of the recent initiatives in the youth mental health sector have reflected an awareness of this preference. So for example, I'm a peer student supporter with my university, and I provide emotional support to students in distress on a weekly basis. I was formally trained by both NUS and the Community Health Assessment Team, or CHAT. So the same concept of trained peer supporters has also been introduced in other IHLs, for example, NTU, SMU, and also SUSS. And this is also reflected in a social, the social sector globally, for example, with the Global Youth Listeners Program. And locally, I believe Campus I has recently launched um, a training program to train a group of peer listeners or peer supporters, means you. Mm -hmm. So on the subject of 
evolving, evolving nature of support, something I feel that we could work on is expanding the type of support services available. So as of now, the type of support available to youths revolves around the concept of counseling and introspection. So basically getting a young person to verbally detail the negative emotions or negative emotional state they are in, and then subsequently understand the reason for the, neg the negative emotions and then engage in goal setting with the counselor to manage or quell those emotions. So this is reflected in the social sector, the private sector and the education sector. However, this technique may not work for everyone. Not everyone is comfortable with sharing their experiences through a verbal medium or sharing them with someone at all, particularly in an Asian society where people are more reserved and are not comfortable discussing their, their emotions openly. So moving forward, we could perhaps, one example would be, we could perhaps shift towards the provision of safe spaces for youths who, who prefer to handle their mental distress independently or, just, or are just not ready to share their distress with someone else. So this safe space, I think mentioned by Ms. Posh, was, could be little rooms in school campuses that provide refuge from the outside world. So for example, in NUS, we have this room called Pit Stop, which is where the peer student supporters are located. So this particular small space contains a nap room uh, art therapy room and also small massage chairs and also tea and coffee and snacks. And it could even be maybe in the future, just thinking out loud, it could be small spaces within the community. So it was, for example, rooms in void decks or neighborhood areas, or perhaps nonprofit organizations promoting mental wellness in youths could have a small little room where a youth could sit and be alone and be charged. Or perhaps it could be or perhaps it could be maybe in, in schools and in different faculties, we just could have rooms where students could just be away from the rigor of, of academic life. Thank you so much, everyone. Back to you, Ming, Ming Siu. Thanks so much, Tasneem. While you we were sharing the Wellbeing uh, Center in uh, NUS, it, I was reminded of SMU. SMU also has a Wellbeing Center, something like a lounge that what Mosun has mentioned earlier. So the students can just chill at the lounge itself. You know, they have Xbox. Uh, they have PS4, right? And then they can just chill and play uh, pool and stuff. Yeah. So nowadays, the local unis have it good, especially for the Gen Zs and the, and the millennials. Yep. Um, yep. So I think we've heard from all four panelists, right, uh, on the amazing work that they've been doing in the public, private, community sectors, and also our young person uh, representative, right? So just now we were talking about ecosystem support, right? So how can the public, private, community sectors come together as an ecosystem to better support our youth in the mental well-being? Yep. So any, any of the panelists, feel free to yeah, share your thoughts. Or we can start with Mosun first. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, I saw some of the questions that were online and actually we could actually intersperse sure. because they are... Do you want to take a look at the questions? I think there were three. Yeah, we actually have some questions here. Yeah. Um, one of the questions is, how do we change the impression of counsellors, um, ensure competency and assure confidentiality for both students and parents? Yeah, so um, I mentioned about um, the image that counsellors have earlier. Uh, could I have that question up again? Sorry. It, yes, and assure confidentiality. So this is something that the task force is actually looking at. Because uh, indeed now, because students in schools are minors, the consent of parents is required. Um, therein lies two difficulties. One is that students may or may not be comfortable with their parents knowing. So I think one question we ask ourselves is, do we look at the degree uh, of uh, the severity of the mental health condition? In other words, does it need to be a one-size-fits-all that all situations require the parent to be informed? I think this is a question that we will have to ask and the task force needs to think about. Um, and under what circumstances does the consent of a parent need to be explicitly sought for when it comes to the intervention? Because like I mentioned earlier, it's a spectrum, you see. So if it's like, actually all the student wants is a listening ear, then actually do you need to seek consent from a parent when actually what the child needs is just to talk to a counsellor or perhaps other support structures to just have a listening ear. Or, in the, in the other extreme, the child may really be, you know, I think just now Tasney mentioned Tier 1 to Tier 4, and she mentioned Tier 4 being the most severe. Um, of course, I think if it's, the child is at risk of self-harm, then I think 
this is a situation where obviously if medical help needs to be introduced um, and it needs to be intervention on the professional or therapeutic side, then I think there needs to be a consensus around the fact that the consent of the parent needs to be sought because we're talking about the life of a minor here. Um, and I think there were other questions about whether or not there is a recommended ratio mm. for schools when it comes to counsellors. Um, actually, schools have different levels of needs. There are schools who have many high-needs students. And in those instances, the MOE would actually provide more counsellors. And when I actually say high-needs, they actually are also very different um, in terms of the types of needs we're talking about. You could have very high-performing students whose needs are actually because they are very stressed academically. They want to perform well and they are afraid of failing their own expectations of themselves, failing community's expectations or failing their parents' expectations. So the type of counselling help they need is of a certain type, which is different from, let's say, a child on another end of it whereby the child may actually be facing family relationship issues. Perhaps financial difficulty causing stress in the family which then impacts the mental health of the student. Then the counsellors who need to help the child would be, I would say, of a different orientation. So in that sense, it's not just a simple question about how many counsellors do we have in the school. It is also about the background of the counsellors, what the school needs, and the MOE will look at it holistically and decide on what is the best combination of counsellors to provide to the schools. There was actually a last question, but really, should I be answering all the questions? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, you could. Uh, we have some more questions, but the other panelists also yes, feel free to away. share. Yeah, yeah um, I'm just aware of time. We have eight minutes left, right? Uh, but we have a few more questions, right? So the next question would be, um, can mental health campaigns include lived experiences of people who have recovered or are actually managing their health conditions uh, similar to the Yellow Ribbon Project um, yeah, yes. with famous people like John Nash. Yeah. You want Posh? I think you can answer this, or you want? I can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, the thing is, like, um, I like to share. Um, there are many people who have been working very hard behind the scene to achieve, you know, the current situation. You know, many people who conducted the research, many people who work on campaign, especially World Mental Health Day. So I'd like to invite everyone to commemorate World Mental Health yeah. Day on the 10th October or within the month of October. And many a times we come together and really discuss with the different agency, you know, sometimes Colleen, right? Being sure all of us will be around, you know, to talk about, hey, what, what do you have in mind? I think uh, Agency for Integrated Care actually called for uh, a, a discussion at Institute of Mental Health, you know, mobilizing everyone to brainstorm ideas as well. So that's such campaign. And of course, we can't just like advocate for mental health only on 10, 10 or you know, within the month of October. It should be you know, you know, throughout the whole year and that's what we have been doing. And you might not know even for uh, most soon, we have met out in private and yes. she's so busy and she's like, Posh, you know you want to meet out? You know, that was one of the evening. And yeah, we had dinner together. Yeah, <laughs> and she asked, no, what else can we do? I mean, that's why I, I, it's not about curry favouring just because she's here. <laughs> The thing is, I want to share how challenging it had been during earlier years. Those who have been working with me know how hard it has been to come to this, this, this day. Thank you, team. Uh, so, yeah. Lucio, I thought to, yeah. on the specific question on lived realities, um, for example, uh, I was working on a project with a bunch of youths, Project You'll Be Alright, and it was entirely about that. It was about stories of people who have had mental health challenges and they have overcome it. So it was a call to action. We received more than 200 stories. We published about 30 of them into an e-book. Uh, we had the support of the MOE. It was one of the youth mental well-being network groups. Um, precisely that lived realities. And we noticed from the submissions that the stories were really used at different stages of their lives. There were youths who were talking about issues that they were having peer-to-peer -peer relationships. There were youths who were... Um, going through a point of transition. What we realise also arising from COVID is there are obviously youths who have unfortunately graduated during the pandemic. And it's quite a huge shift from, for them to move from studying from home um, and then going out to the workforce 
or even those youths who have gone into the workforce during the pandemic, they have largely worked from home and then they have suddenly had to go back to work and there are terms such as social rust, I think that we are hearing. So all these can actually cause mental well-being issues. So I think from the stories we gathered, we know this as because youths, you can imagine, right, between the age of 10, perhaps the onset of puberty, all the way till, say, 25, there are huge, period, huge periods of change throughout. You're growing up, your body is undergoing changes, you're going to different schools, making different friends, you are exploring your identity, thinking about career choices, you are then whacked with the pandemic, and then you have to go out into the workforce. You can imagine all these transition points are actually points whereby you can have stress and cause you mental well-being issues. So precisely that, to answer the question that came uh, online, we, through the project, we are reflecting the lived realities of young people in this day and age. And apart from Project Silver Ribbon, there's also Project Green Ribbon, which is another NGO. I was on one of the uh, uh, online webinars, and I was invited as one of the panelists and the other panelists, and we were all there to share our personal stories about mental health. And so exactly that. I think lived realities and shared experiences are very important. Thank you. Thanks, Mosun and uh, Porsche. I just want to build on um, what Mosun and Porsche has mentioned. Actually, um, there, are, there is actually a national uh, anti-stigma campaign that actually um, gets people with lived experiences, not just young people, to actually share um, their personal recovery stories. Yeah, and that is beyond the label. Yeah, so we work very closely with the National Council of Social Service, which is NCSS. I think a lot of partners here also work very closely with them. And um, we've been working with them since 2018 when they launched uh, beyond the Label campaign uh, by then Senior Minister Taman. Yeah, and it has been ongoing over the past five years. Yep. So um, if you know, you're keen to actually find out more, um, you can actually go online uh, on their social media pages to actually get to know more. Yep. And well, the, the questions are coming in <laughs> fast and furious. So um, I think there's another question asking, beyond social media and mental health education in schools, how can we better engage our local youth? Shall we hear from the young person? Yes. Uh, Tasneem is you. We're not very young here. Yeah, Tasneem, all of us. We are the young person. <laughs> so it was beyond education and social media. Is, was that the two yeah, so areas? Beyond, that... beyond social media uh, and... Sorry, what's the question? <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, beyond social media and mental health education in schools, how can we better engage uh, our youths? Hmm. Oh, this is a tough one. Those are the two, probably the two big mediums people get their information from. I think, I think with social media, there is a hidden barrier that comes with it that people don't really notice that's actually negatively affecting the mental health of youths. I think it was mentioned in a previous panel. I think we really have to educate our youths on what is credible content and what is not. And sometimes the, dif the differentiation between reality and fantasy or whatever exists in the social media world because I think a lot of sometimes a, a large factor negatively affecting youth's mental health would be perceiving whatever there is on social media as reality so that affects perhaps their expectations in life because sometimes everything in social media covers all the bad and hyper exaggerates the good so that, ne that negatively affects a youth's mental well-being so it, I think a with social media itself, there's so much to unpack. And I think one thing is really helping youths understand how to use social media responsibly and in a way that is conducive to their mental well-being, and specifically how to differentiate reality from reality from fantasy. And I think I, I think this was mentioned previously. I think it definitely helps to have safe spaces. A, within the community, whether it be in the neighborhood or it be an extension of a NGO or within schools, because sometimes all a young person needs is just time to reflect on their own personal well-being and their cognition and just take a breather from everyday life and just really be present with their thoughts and feelings in the moment. Or perhaps it could be with a, even a trained peer supporter or just even a friend. So I would say definitely having that space to really reflect and think about your own mental health and just to, and let's say if you are educated on mental health, just take some time to think about how it applies to your everyday living. So I would say definitely safe spaces is, I think, a good medium to not only recharge 
and just have a space to just be with your thoughts and feelings, but also to reflect on all the information out there and how it could be applied to your everyday life. Thanks, Ming Siu. Thanks, Sestin. We only have 16 seconds left. Uh, so we're closing off the panel. But uh, Moss and uh, Posh or even Colleen, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add on to yeah. what Tasnim said, right? Sometimes the way to look at a problem, if you're talking about mental health, is not just to go and look at the problem itself only. Sometimes by doing other things like physical exercise, reading, music, actually that can offer the solution to better mental health. Um, so actually that was in response to the last question we had because um, community spaces are important because community spaces are where people interact and they interact to do what? They interact perhaps to watch a movie together, they interact perhaps to do a sport together, they perhaps get together to appreciate music together, do music, play music together, and actually all that contributes to better mental well-being. And that's also one of the reasons why during the pandemic, because there was social distancing and people were kept apart, that mental well-being became such, and mental health became such a, critical issue and problem. But now with relaxation, I think you can sense that people are genuinely happier, right? People are out and about, you know, being around people, and that itself gives you energy. And I think sometimes the professionals will also tell you that when you are most, um, when, you are, when you are most sometimes thinking negatively and you are in a rut, sometimes what helps is to be present and to be grounded. And what that means is to, in a sensorial way, be aware of actually what is happening to you physically. What are the smells that you smell? Do you feel the wind in your hair? You know, what, what do you touch? What do you sense around you? Those grounding things are actually keep you in the present because people always either regret the past or worry about the future. But when you are there present and really being present, that is where actually perhaps your mental health is at its best. Over to you. <laughs> Words of wisdom <laughs> from Mawson, yeah. Wow. Staying in the present, right? Uh, Posh. I mean, like, uh, I'd like to share, for Silver Ribbon, um, if you talk about, like, um, besides social media, engaging them in social media or talks or workshops, you should empower them to do more. So for Silver Ribbon, we do have a youth chapter where we involve 884 youths from different school institutions to brainstorm ideas, to share their views, and what else can we do further? So involve them when we are doing something for them. Or the best thing is work with them, and this is very important. And second thing is like, um, we haven't talking so much about parents how about grandparents? Grandparents are equally important because most of the parents are very busy and they are placed in the care under the grandparents. And most of the time when we work with uh, the radio station, 95.8, a Chinese radio station reaching out to grandparents, we receive a lot of calls from grandparents. How can I take care of my grandchildren? Thank you. Thanks, Bosch. Colleen. Yeah. Sure, just, to add on, just to add on that, um, yeah. Jardines and Mindset, we have also been working with various organisations, so the likes of Singapore Mental Health Firm Festival, to su provide support on, on their short firm youth competition. So that we get youth to create short firms and be mental health advocates. Another project that we have is our flagship, where we work with Touch Community Services on digital mindset. I mean, a really apt topic for today because we want to bring them out of excessive screen time usage, excessive cyber gaming, and how to really gain the social skills. And as corporates, it's really important because one of the things that we do in this project is to take these youths away from the screen, tell them how to game responsibly, not, not to not do it at all, but responsible time, and also bring them to our corporates back of house, you know, hospital, uh, hospitality back of house, our industrial back of house to see what is a career like. Look and plan for your career in advance and not just looking at the screens. So with that, I think call to action here, you know, we can get more corporates probably to join us in this to help the youth transit into the workforce. And of course, from there, as what I mentioned earlier, we are spending one third or more of our times in the workforce and hopefully from there, take care of your employees' mental well-being for long. Thanks so much, Colleen. So as we come to an end uh, to our discussion, it's actually saying zero now at the screen. <laughs> yeah, so we'd like to thank our esteemed panel of speakers for their invite, insightful sharing. Uh, and we would also like to thank our online and in-person audience um, for your active participation and rich discussion. With that, it is our hope that as a nation, we can start to move beyond awareness and towards greater mental support for our youth for the future. Thank you.